This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm a Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a highly acclaimed singer, recording artist, and actress. She made her Broadway debut in Merrily We Roll Along. She received a Tony Award nomination for her performance as Lizzie in Baby, and for five years, she dazzled audiences as Grizabella in Cats. She also starred in the original productions of Miss Saigon, The Three Musketeers, and The Look of Love. In addition to receiving a Drama Desk Award nomination for her performance in the Spitfire Grill, she co-starred in the legendary Follies in Concert at Lincoln Center, and she's played such diverse roles as Dot in Sunday in the Park with George, Ava Perone in Evita, Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, and she starred in the European premiere of Sondheim on Sondheim at the Royal Festival Hall in London. In the movies, she sang the Academy Award-nominated song Journey to the Past in the animated feature film Anastasia, and she's the singing voice of Princess Jasmine in Disney's Aladdin and the King of Thieves and The Return of Jafar. You can also hear her beautiful voice in a number of other animated feature films, including Beauty and the Beast, The Swan Princess, Pocahontas, Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, and Despicable Me. She's appeared in many TV shows and won an Emmy Award for hosting Ready to Go, a daily live children's program. She's released eight solo albums, including two live albums with her magnificently equally talented sister, Anne Hampton Calloway, with whom she performs regularly in concert halls and nightclubs across America. And her latest album, entitled To Steve With Love, Liz Calloway Celebrates Sondheim, has just been nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Traditional Pop Vocal Album. Our guest has performed in concert at some of the most prestigious venues in the world, including the Kennedy Center, Carnegie Hall, the Hollywood Bowl, the Théâtre du Châtelet in Paris, and the Grand Théâtre de Lissou in Barcelona. I'm delighted to welcome the incomparable Liz Calloway to our show. Liz, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Harvey. And may I just say, you have fabulous accents. I was like really impressed with how you read off those European venues. Good for well, it you. It must have been really exciting for you to be there. I wish I had been there oh. to see you. Oh, it was incredible. It was incredible. Actually, and most recently, I, I did my Sondheim show in Madrid at the beautiful opera house there. And, and it's just, I love to travel. So any chance I can to perform, you know, in Europe is just such a thrill. Oh, for sure. Well, I want to start by congratulating you on your first Grammy nomination. This is so exciting, Liz, and so well-deserved. Thank you so much. And in, in, in hearing your intro, I, I still have to pinch myself that it's real. And it's just, I'm, I was very surprised and and I'm just so honored to receive a Grammy nomination for that for that album uh, uh, particularly. Well, for those people who don't yet have Liz's latest album, it's called To Steve With Love, Liz Calloway Celebrates Sondheim, and it's a live album recorded at the 54 Below nightclub in New York, and Broadway World said that this is the most important Sondheim show ever, and it should absolutely not be missed. Liz, can you tell us how you and your husband, Dan Foster, developed the concept of the show? Well, after... I, I was originally scheduled to do a movies movie music show at 54 Below, this nightclub in New York that I've performed at many times, as has my sister Anne. And after Sondheim passed away in November of, was it? 22? 22. I, he was such an important part of my career and my life. I... I just suddenly had this feeling, I want to pay tribute to him. And so I let the, I called up the 54 Below people and said, instead of singing movie music, can I do an evening of Sondheim? And they said, please do, we would love that. And Dan and I kind of sat down and I I, I made a list of some songs I'd want to do more and, and stories I'd want to tell. 
And it just sort of went from there. It was very kind of organic. It's a very personal show. The hardest thing was coming up with an opening number because Sondheim wrote such show specific songs and I didn't want to I didn't want to do just some trite opening number and I finally came up with a four song medley including someone in a tree that was very it, it really kind of summed up my experience of being in the room with Sondheim you know very early in my career and and then throughout and so I you know we we sat down, we talked about it, what I, you know, what I might say. It was a lot of, so, of songs I had done, but a lot of songs I had to learn. So it was very good for my brain fitness. As every time I do the show, it's like, okay, concentrate. I did four shows of my Sondheim tribute in March of 23. And afterwards, all these people came up to me and said, you really should record this show. There was something really special about it. And, and so I put on my producer hat and I went, okay, I'm going to make a live album of this show. And I went back to 54 Below did in June and did two more performances that we recorded. No pressure. And, and then with lots of work and editing, you know, we, we put out the album last November and then 364 days later from the uh, when the album was released, the Grammy nominations came out and just completely, I was stunned. I had all these, I had all these texts. Oh my God, congratulations on your nomination. I thought maybe I've been nominated for my liner notes. <laughs> so it's been, it's just been kind of a, 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 it's all been a dream, but it all started with me just wanting to sing Sondheim and and sing it for people really wanted to hear his music after he passed away I think I mean we all knew he he wouldn't live forever but there was such a collective grieving period and being able to do this show just kind of brought us all together so it was it's it's and every time I do the show it's it's an amazing experience well, I think Stephen Sondheim is shining from above on you. Uh, you've said before that Sondheim didn't just change the landscape of musical theater. He also changed you as a performer. Can you tell us how? Well, you know, when I worked with him and met him, I was so young. Merrily, we rolled along. I was cast when I was 19 years old. And then I did all, you know, Follies in Concert and a Stephen Sondheim evening. And the thing that's really interesting to me now is I'm 62 now. And it's it's only better now. So he, he wrote such rich material for women and older women. And so there are all these songs that I never thought I, I could sing because, of course, I still consider myself to be, you know, 25 years old. But now there's so much I I can explore and and singing the songs that, that I did when I was 21 have I completely understand them more now because of course I've had life experience. So that was his final gift to me. The the gift was working with him and but he's left so, so many treasures to sing. And I it's like my lifelong mission to keep singing his music and to make sure that new generations know his music. Well, now this album is something of a family affair because a certain guest vocalist by the name of Nicholas Calloway Foster sings a duet with you on the song Move On. That's your son, right? Yes. And, you know, I knew Sunday in the Park with George is probably my favorite Sondheim musical, although Company is is a close second. And I knew I wanted to, I had to sing Move On in the concert. It's just, it's probably my favorite Sondheim song and I love the message of it. And I've sung it with many, some wonderful Broadway performers, but it was such a personal show. And I had sung it once with Nicholas and I just thought, oh no, this is the perfect, this is perfect to have him come up. He was sort of my secret weapon 
because he was a surprise guest and I talk about him throughout the show. And, and so to surprise the audience by having him come out and he's such a beautiful singer and it's, it's actually, I, I said how Sondheim writes such show specific songs. It works really well as a mother son song, I think. And, so I'm I'm just delighted. And Nicholas and Dan will be coming out with me to the Grammy Awards. <laughs> it's a family affair, so we're all going to be together. Oh, that's just wonderful. Is Nicholas going to pursue a career in music? No, actually, I, I mean, he he has he's done a lot of singing, but he not that long ago got his MBA at NYU Stern and he has uh, his own business and he's doing incredibly well there. And but every so often I'll say, hey, what are you doing? Will you come and sing with me? And and it's it's just a, a joy to get to sing with him. And because he's got a whole other life, when he, his his superpower is karaoke. So when he goes home, <laughs> people he went to business school with, and they're at a karaoke bar and they'll be they'll listen to him sing and they'll be like, Oh my God. So yes, he sings professionally and in karaoke bars still and he's got an mba so he's a left brain and a right brain guy Absolutely. Well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one of my little dream fantasies i would love to see an album a trio with aunt Anne in there too ah uh, you know that's a wonderful that's a wonderful idea and Anne has sung bridge over troubled water with with nicholas and yeah no i think it's a wonderful idea or at least a concert you know yeah, I'll mention that, that to Anne. <laughs> oh, that would be so great. Now, when I look at your career, Liz, one of the things that really stands out is that you managed to play Grizabella in Cats for five years. How in the world did you have the stamina to do that? Well, I I, I will tell you that it, it was it wasn't five years in a row. The people at Cats were incredibly generous and gave me time off to, for instance, the first time Anna and I did sibling revelry at Rainbow and Stars, they gave me two weeks off to do that. They gave me time off to fly to LA for a week and record Anastasia. So it wasn't like doing it every single, you know, five years in a row, six days a week. But it was but a lot. It was a lot. And I was also very lucky because, you know, I, I was able to bring Nicholas to work with me when he was young because I had like 14 minutes of stage time and a very good agent who <laughs> who said, can she bring her son to work? So I was able to kind of be a working mom and a, you know, on Broadway at the same time as, as you know, raising Nicholas, which really made a huge difference. And I love doing Cats. It was, it surprised me. When I saw the show, I enjoyed it and I loved memory and I loved the Jellicle Ball, but I was like, hmm. And it wasn't until I did the show myself, I was like, oh, wow, this is something really special. And whenever I sing memory in concert, it's it makes people very happy. I feel really fortunate to have done gotten to do that part and sung that song on Broadway for so long. And I have a very nice house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you earned it, my dear. You well, earned it. I think there was an article in the New York Times about about uh, actors trying to get mortgages, and it was because I was in a law. It was really hard because it's such a unpredictable profession. And, but the fact that I was in a long running show made it possible for me to get a mortgage. So I'm, I'm grateful to cats for that too. <laughs> Absolutely. Now in my introduction, I mentioned some of the major starring roles you've played in musical theater. Is there one role that stands out as your favorite? I would, I would say it would be a tie between Lizzie and baby which I did very early in my career. That would probably be number one. And But more recently, I loved doing Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard. That was a real challenge. 
And I, I loved, I love doing that. I'd love to do that part again. Oh my, I'd love to see you do that. I'm intrigued by your 2015 album entitled The Essential Liz Calloway, because you've included not only some of your biggest songs from musical theater you've done, but also a few classic pop songs like Downtown, Didn't We, Leaving on a Jet Plane. What makes those songs essential in your repertoire? Well, I did an album called The Beat Goes On, which was was a collection of my favorite songs from the 60s. There were a couple of, there was one song from Hair and one song from Promises, Promises, but everything else was pop music from that time. And I've, I've always had this affinity for 60s pop music. And I just feel like that's a real, that's a part of me. And so when I, I produced, I've produced my last five albums in part to my son Nicholas inspiring me to discover my entrepreneurial side. And so when I was putting together the essential Liz Calloway, I thought I really need to include some of these pop songs because they're they're so important to me. Leaving on a jet plane is one of my favorite arrangements I did with my longtime musical director, Alex Rybeck. And it just started as an improv. And I, I always record, back then it was with a, a, a Walkman, <laughs> but I record all our rehearsals. And I listened back when we were doing this album, I was like, that's it. We don't have to change anything. It tells us, I, because I think pop songs, you, can t- you need to tell a story with. And so I'm, I definitely wanted to, to include some of, some of those. And I'd actually, I was thinking of trying to re-release the beat goes on, but maybe do it on vinyl, which would be kind of fun to have a 60, you know, a 60s album on vinyl would be cool. Yeah, that would be very retro. I have another idea for you. You don't mind if I give it to you? I love ideas. Bring them on. I think you have the perfect voice to do a tribute album to Karen Carpenter. Ah. I have always thought, especially when I hear you do pop songs, that you have a perfect pop voice. So I'm going to let that marinate in your head. You know, I've sung a few of her songs and I love, I loved Karen Carpenter. And that's an interesting idea. I I am, I don't, I, I'd have to find a way to put my own spin on, on those songs because I think she was so unique. And- she was, but there's no doubt that you could do that. No doubt. Now, you know, that's a great you- idea. I'm going to, I'm going to write that down after we talk. <laughs> oh, that's great. See, I've had two ideas, you and, and Nicholas. And I'll tell you why I got the idea about the Carpenters. We're, there's a new movie out about Karen Carpenter that's making the festival film festival circuit right now. And the filmmakers coming on our show, the movie is called Karen Carpenter starving for perfection. And oh. when I watched it and I heard these clips of her songs, you kept coming into my head because I know you've got the resonance in your voice. You have the timber. You have a certain way of singing a pop song that makes it sound fresh. So that's where the idea came from. Oh, wow. Well, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm right now I'm just immediately my head is like spinning with Karen Carpenter songs. I I did a, a um in the during the pandemic I I made a a Christmas album with uh, Peter Kahlo, a wonderful guitarist who lives down the street from me who's played for Carly Simon for many years and we did uh, Merry Christmas Darling. But I did a symphony concert of, of Carol King music uh, some years back. And I sang, it's going to take some time this time, which is just a wonderful carpenter song. And oh, oh, boy, you've got me. uh, You've got me very intrigued. Well, I'm glad about that. Now, when we had your fabulous sister, Anne, on our show last year, who I can't even tell you how much I adore her and you. I told her that I'm addicted to your two live albums with her, Sibling Revelry and Boom, because your voices blend together so magnificently. In fact, to use the words of Billy Stritch, the blend is sublime. 
Aww. And your choice of material is so enjoyable. Can you articulate for us, what does it feel like deep down inside when you're singing with your sister? It feels yummy. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like putting my hand in a cashmere lined glove. It's just this cozy, it, it's just, it feels right. We fit. Our voices are so different. And yet when we come together, it's just, it's just magic. And I love singing with Anne more than anything. In fact, when we do our shows together, when, you know, we always do a few solos each and then the rest are duets and I enjoy doing my solos, but then it's like, Oh, good. Now we get to sing together again. It's just, it's, it's so, it's, it's so special. And we're so lucky that we get to do what we love and that we get to do it together sometimes. And we, Anne used to live five minutes from me. And now she, five years ago, she moved to Tucson and I, I'm in New York. And so we don't see each other that often. So we, tr when we can work together and spend, you know, it's, it's, doubly special because we get to have sister time, but then we also get to make music together. Can I tell you what my favorite duet is that you do with Anne? Yes, please. It's That's the Way I've Always Heard It Should Be, which is on your Passage of Time album and on your Boom Live album. Yes. I wonder if Carly Simon has ever heard that version. She has heard it and she loves it, as a matter of fact. When we first did it, before we recorded it, I don't know how Anne got it to her, but yeah, no, she loved it. That's one of my favorite duets that we do together. There's actually, you know, I have a lot of ideas for albums I want to make. And of course, Anne and I are due to make another album. And, but we have a, an arrangement that we do in our show, Broadway, the Callaway of Corner of the Sky. That is, I don't know if you've heard it yet, from Pippin, and it's and it's uh, it's on my YouTube channel. You can hear us singing it, but that needs we need to record that because it's a very kind of a different arrangement and a sister a sister story behind it. And and Dan, my husband, helped us create that arrangement along with Alex Rybeck, and it's very special. So I I'm I'm even thinking maybe I should just. We should just do a single of it and get it out there at least why wait for an entire album you know get that song out there well it's a great idea i i'm glad to hear that you're going to do another album with Anne. could you please promise me well, we that? hope so we hope so <laughs> oh we'll make it happen i want you a promise that you and ann will come back on our show to promote that new album whenever it's released Yes, and and I will and I will make sure that we're in the same. We could do it from our homes, but I but that'll be an excuse for us to be in the same city together to do your interview. <laughs> oh, that would be wonderful. Now, Liz, you've provided the singing voice of many animated characters in movies, like Anya in Anastasia, Odette in The Swan Princess, Jasmine in two Aladdin movies, and you were the voice of the adult Kiara in The Lion King 2. And let's not forget that you were one of the three silly girls in Beauty and the Beast. We can't forget that, can and we? A singing and, and a singing and dancing napkin ring in Be Our Guest. Uh <laughs> That's right. So my question is this, is singing as an animated character a different skill than singing on the stage as a human character? It's, it's a little different. You know, often when you do an animated movie, you are given they they'll they'll show me a storyboard of just you know some sketches of what what is happening in the scene, and you really have to use your imagination. It takes intense concentration in the recording in the booth to to just imagine. You don't sing as loud. It's like the difference between stage acting and film acting. It's a little more subtle. In animated movie work, you often have many people giving you feedback while you're recording. I love it. It all comes down to the same 
you know, acting and storytelling. So that is what is, there's no difference in that, but just technically it's a little different. It's an incredibly challenging, but one of the things that, that has surprised me about all the animated movie work I've done is how important these movies are to people. Anastasia in particular, I just did a, a tribute at Carnegie Hall to composer Stephen Flaherty, who wrote the music to Anastasia. And just to find out how meaningful and, you know, people have come up to me all the time and say, you are the soundtrack of my childhood. And that just means so much to me. And, you know, to, to have that as part of my legacy is, is oh, it's really monumental. Special. Yes. It's really special. Well, you've had a lot of career highlights. I'd like to ask you about some of them. I'm going to start with your performance as Young Sally in the Lincoln Center concert production of Follies. You co-starred with Mandy Patinkin, Barbara Cook, Carol Burnett, Elaine Stritch, and so many others, accompanied by the New York Philharmonic. That show was made into a fabulous album and a documentary film. Was that one of the most memorable performances of your career? It was. It was absolutely thrilling. It was a terrifying experience in some ways because we only had five days to rehearse and and we were just we didn't know if we were prepared and 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 then when the we we came out for our entrance and we walked all the women and we walked through the 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 Philharmonic Orchestra towards the audience and just and I talk about this in my Sondheim show and album. It was like the tsunami of sound and applause. And it was just, it was incredible. We did two performances and it was like the highest of highs. I also remember then when it was over, I was so depressed. There was a, a review. We did it on a Friday and Saturday night. And then on Monday, there was a review of it in the New York Times. It was like the greatest, you know, event and it was so wonderful, but it was over. And I was just like, oh, you know, and and it was, but now I look back and I think, boy, to, it's about those moments, you know, in your life, in your career that are so special just to have had them. And I think that's one of the reasons people have enjoyed my Sondheim show and album is because I I can share being in the room and being a part of, you know, being a part of, of history, even if it only lasted a couple of nights. It was absolutely a, a huge highlight of my career. Well, I'm so glad to hear that because that album and the film are so special. Do you ever sit back and listen to that album? I did listen to it again when I was putting together my show and I and wa and I watched the documentary which I had never seen before. I had just when they filmed it during rehearsals and for some reason I just never watched it when it came out and I remember when I started rehearsals for Miss Saigon there's a part in the in the documentary that shows us right before we go out on stage when we were terribly nervous and I remember saying, as a joke, I am young Sally. I am young Sally. And I just kind of was joking around. So Billy Porter was in the chorus of Miss Saigon. And the first day he walked up to me at rehearsal and he said, I am young Sally. I am young Sally. <laughs> which, I, which I loved. He's adorable. Oh, he's fantastic. He's so, he's a wonderful He's a wonderful person, incredible singer. We we recorded a duet years ago on one of my er earliest albums of Where is Love? And I couldn't be happier for him and his success. Oh, yeah. He's the exemplification of authenticity in my book. Now, in 2003, you starred in a Broadway musical called The Look of Love, featuring the music of Burt Bacharach and Hal David. That was probably one of the very first jukebox musicals, I think. Oh, you know, you might be right. It was definitely one of the earlier ones. But yeah. the show closed after 35 previews and 49 performances. Why do you think the show didn't make it? You know, I think reviews, because it was actually, you know, some jukebox musicals 
have plot. Most of them have a plot of sorts now. But that was a pure review. And I think reviews are really tough. It had, of course, an incredible score. I I deeply regret we didn't we didn't record it, make an album of it, because it was had wonderful arrangements by David Loud, who I did Merrily We Roll Along with. And Anne Ranking was the choreographer. But it it I don't know if it worked totally as as a show, you know. I, I don't know. It 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 was not received particularly well, and it's too bad because I'm a huge Bacharach and David fan. Okay, so then I can't resist. I can't resist telling you. Okay. I also have this fantasy of a duet album with Anne Hampton Calloway doing Bacharach and David. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I always, this is what I do in my spare time. I think of ways that you and Anne can deliver more (laughs) albums. So a tribute album. Now you sang at Hal David's 90th birthday celebration, co-starring with Burt Bacharach, Dion Warwick, Stevie Wonder. That must have been exhilarating. Oh my God, it was such an honor. Hal had seen Anne and me do Boom at Pepperdine University. And... He and in that show, I do always something there to remind me. And he loved he loved the show. And then, yes, he asked me if I would come and be a part of it. And it was like Cinderella at the ball with these unbelievable artists, you know, and me. And <laughs> it was it was and I, Hal was Hal was such a wonderful man, and it, that was a real that was a pinch me moment it was really really fun don't you listen to your own voice and realize that you're an unbelievable artist do you get how well you sing i i think i think i'm a very i yeah i think i'm a really good singer you know it's hard it used to be really hard for me to listen to myself i think i was more critical you know, more of a perfectionist when I was younger. And even now it's like, whoa, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely not as easy to sing as it, it's not as effortless as it was when I was younger, but I've always felt that I was very unique. And I've always felt that my voice and how I sing and how I tell a story is very unique. And I, do you know why it's unique? I'll tell you why I told your sister the same thing. I happen to believe that there's a healing quality in Anne's voice and your voice. And when you sing together, it's very healing. Mm -hmm. There's an energy that is emitted from the sound of those two voices, individually or together. I think that's what makes you so unique. Wow. Thank you. You know, I've, I, during the pandemic and even before it, I, I love to sing in my car and I I've made a lot of videos I call it auto tunes of me rehearsing in my car and I've had so many people come up to me and just saying you don't know how you you got me through the pandemic hearing you sing and 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 that's so soak it up soak it uh, up yeah. when yeah, you perform no, I, I I feel you know and thank you I I do I I I think I'm beginning to realize that I I can do good in the world. I used to not, I used to feel like, oh, yeah, it's great that I sing and I do theater, but I didn't know if I, I ever made a difference. And well, now I, I just want you I to like know. I can, I can with my music. I just want you to know that when you're singing with these great giants, you're in that league. I'll give you another pinch me moment. I would assume when you were singing Chances Are with Johnny Mathis, that must have been a pinch me moment. I was just thinking of Johnny today when I was having my coffee. That was amazing. I've always been a huge Johnny Mathis fan. Dan, my husband, huge, huge Johnny Mathis fan. I love his all his Christmas albums and 
and this was a private event in Vancouver that I was going to be singing memory at. And, and then I, uh, the director and producer said, so I understand that you're a big Johnny Mathis fan. He's going to be performing. Would you like to maybe do a duet with him? And I was like, are you kidding? And I'm telling you, he is such a beautiful human being. And we've become friends. I, I, I've i seen him many times in concert. In my feeling of maybe doing a duet album, he is on my list to, if I if I do an album that's that's all duets, I'd love to sing, record a song with Johnny. Oh, that would be amazing. I got to see you at Feinstein's with Jimmy Webb and Paul Williams. Oh and- my God, I was just thinking about them too, because I, I think, I know I'm going to see Paul. There's all these events for the Grammys, including this ASCAP brunch a couple of days beforehand. And, and so I know I'm going to see Paul and, and Paul and Jimmy were at Hal David's 90th concert. So, oh my God, that was, you did your research, but you also, you you're absolutely right in these incredible moments of my life. That that was another one. Yeah, I have to tell you, I loved it. We had Paul Williams on the show. He's become a very good friend. You will see him at the ASCAP Lounge. You'll see my friend Dan Foliart, who's also been on our show. And so one of my other fantasies is that you do a Jimmy Webb, Paul Williams album as well. Now you well, probably- you know, that, that could be done, you know, and of course... Paul wrote the lyrics to some of the Karen Carpenter songs. And he wrote, you know, we've only just begun and raining days and Mondays always get me down. And well, you see, if you do the Karen Carpenter album, you'll be doing a lot of Paul Williams songs. Right. Right. And oh, I, and I, and Jimmy Webb, I absolutely adore, adore, adore. And he's just And they both were so, I was their special guest at this, I think it was a two week engagement and it was right after 9-11. So we had very small houses and, but they were so kind to me and I would just be in the, you know, backstage area and they'd be telling stories. I would just soak it all up. And that was, that was very, very special. Yeah, I could see. I really enjoyed that show. I also went to see you at 54 Below. It was just before the pandemic. It was a show called Sets and the City. Oh, wow. (laughs) Just for the benefit of the viewers, S-E-T-S, Sets in the City. Sets in the City, yes. And what I like about that show, I just wanted to mention, that show didn't have an overall theme like many of your other shows. And I thought it was very refreshing. I really loved it. Oh, thank you. You know, it, it was, it's like when you, this is, and Anne will say the same thing, you know, when you, you book a show and you have to come up with a title. So you come up with a title before you have any idea what you're singing. And <laughs> that's just the process of it. And uh, it's like, and then you figure out what you're going to do. And with sets in the city, I think Dan came up with that title. And then I, I like to ask for song suggestions on Facebook and I had all these, every time I do a show or an album, it's, it, I have a concert coming up in Tribeca at the end of February. And I'm probably today going to put something up on Facebook saying, what would you like me to sing? But I got all these song suggestions and they were all like New York songs and urban songs. So it ultimately kind of had a theme, but I didn't know it was going to be that, but it was a super loose theme and and that was kind of fun without you know it without it being so specific. It's almost easier to put together a show when you have a theme, ra- rather than just you know it's hard when there's so many amazing songs you can do and like okay how do I how do I craft an evening? Well, it really worked. I just want to oh. hear you sing, so I'm happy. Ah, oh, thank you. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Liz Calloway, buy her music and see her concert schedule by going to her official website, lizcalloway.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Liz Calloway YouTube channel as well. 
Well, Liz, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and having this chance to celebrate your magnificent career. Congratulations again on your Grammy nomination. We will all be rooting for you on February the 4th. Thank you so much for appearing on our show. Thank you, Harvey. And thank you for your wonderful album suggestions. I'm going to write them down right now. <laughs> I will be sending you more. Okay. <laughs> our guest has been the one and only Liz Calloway. Her latest album, To Steve With Love, Liz Calloway Celebrates Sondheim, is now available on Amazon, iTunes, and every music streaming platform. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.